We are again blessed to be able to assemble together on the first day of the week to worship God, to praise Him, and as we have observed the memorial unto His Son and our Savior's death, burial, and His resurrection. And I would encourage you, if you would, to obtain your Bible and follow along with me as we have a study this morning that I'd like to expand upon on the three great resurrections. One of the unique features and exclusive characteristics of Christianity is indeed the resurrection. A Christian's hope of immortality is founded on the concept of the resurrection. As we reflect upon God's word, we can determine that he has declared before us within his word three great resurrections. God's appeal to man is consistent with the terms that he has established within these resurrections. And within those terms, we have established for us hope for the faithful, hopelessness for the disobedient. I would like for us to first examine the reality of a resurrection and then investigate each of the three great resurrections that God has revealed to us in his word. So let's look at the reality of a resurrection. And notice Abraham. In Abraham's account, as we know of the offering of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, God had given instruction to Abraham to go and offer his son as a sacrifice and to prepare and to get a donkey in the wood and those servants with him. And after three days journey, they arrived to a point where he could see the place for the sacrifice in a distance. Noticing in Genesis chapter 22, beginning there in verse five. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to, to Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. <clears throat> so the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and it offered up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So in this account, we certainly see the working of Abraham and his faith and his obedience unto God, following the order that God had given to him to offer up his son. And Abraham, as we understand, acted upon this faith and his belief in God. And Abraham acted obedient in all this instruction that was given to him by God to render his son as a sacrifice. Abraham believed in the resurrection. Abraham knew that when he would offer his son as a burnt offering, that God would be able to raise him from the dead. In verse 5 of Genesis 22, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, 
and we will come back to you. Both of them to come back because he believed in the resurrection. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17, noting there, by faith Abraham, and we have just read one of the accounts of Abraham being faithful, being obedient in his beliefs. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. He believed that God would be able to raise his son, even from the dead in his faith, as we noted here in verse 11. Therefore, Abraham believed in the resurrection. Let's direct our thoughts now to Job. And in our class this morning, we made reference to Job, that Job was a righteous man. He walked righteous before God. He was obedient unto God. He would avoid evil. And he instructed his children and his family to be fearful of God. And Satan appeared, and God asked Satan, what have you been doing? And Satan said, I have been walking to and fro across the face of the earth. And he said, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, you have a wall around Job. Job only fears you because of the abundance of the blessings from your hand that you have given him. If you take your hand and you remove those blessings, Job will certainly curse you to the face. But God knew the heart of Job. God knew the mind of Job, just like he knows our mind, our sincerity, our determinations to serve and to glorify him. And Job, in the account in Job 14, also believed in the resurrection. Beginning there in verse 12, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me unto your wrath is past that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Job is asking us a rhetorical question of which he knew the answer. He says, if a man dies, shall he live again? Job believed in the resurrection. He knew that if a man dies, he will live again. We know, as the scriptures have taught us, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The judgment is before all, because there is a life before us after this death. Job believed in the resurrection. Job knew of a coming resurrection. In verse 12, he states, Till the heavens are no more, they will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. He is establishing that there is a point in time of which all things will end, that the heavens will be no more, and people are going to sleep until that time. As we know, when that time comes and the kingdom is delivered unto the Father, and all things are brought to an end as we know them. So he is establishing that prior to this point in time, man will not awake nor be roused from their sleep, waiting for that time to come. Job knew that a resurrection would come, and with its coming would also come a change. He is waiting for that change to come. And that's what he's described for us here. In verse 14, Job declares that all the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Our works precede us. The things that we do in this life will be accounted for. Job knew that. He knew that there was going to be a resurrection. Let's now direct our thoughts to Daniel, the prophet. In Daniel chapter 12, beginning there in verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, 
the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, there was a nation, excuse me, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting con contempt. And this is another point that Stephen brought out in our class, in our study today, that there is an appointed time. There is a conclusion to all things as we know them. Daniel prophesied of a coming resurrection, and with the resurrection, there will be a separation. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. God has made a distinction. That distinction in our rock-solid faith that we have been studying about is a distinction between light and darkness a distinction between truth and error, a distinction that is being established here for us, a distinction between one of eternal life in the presence of God or to be separated from Him. That life will go on after this life ends because there is a resurrection. Now let's notice, of course, Jesus Himself. In John chapter 5, beginning there in verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the time is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The message remains consistent. There will be a resurrection. And you're going to take part in that resurrection. All who have lived upon the face of this earth will either be resurrected to eternal life or resurrected to condemnation. Those that have died and are in the earth and the dust is over us as we have just read about previously. The Apostle John has given us record of Jesus pronouncing the coming resurrection. Jesus affirms that the resurrection will consist of two forms, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. God has made distinctions and he will again at the end of all time. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, beginning there, he says, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus is declaring the resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection of life and there is going to be his resurrection. And Jesus is foretelling of the sufferings that would come to him by the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and how he would be killed and his resurrection would take place on the third day. Jesus believed in the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is a victory over death. As we know in Matthew chapter 28, and I'd like to begin there in verse 1 to capture the entire thought of this passage. Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. 
and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So there are many that do believe in the resurrection who had become eyewitnesses. And certainly the guards that were there who were as dead men because they were in shock and awe of the event that occurred with the presence as well as the two Marys and then later a whole host of those who had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus' resurrection for us as we understand is a victory over death and that is determined here for us in these passages that we have just read as well as other accounts. So the resurrection is a reality. And we can establish that reality throughout the ages. And those that believed and established for us in confidence the resurrection, those of great faith. So the first of these three great resurrections that I would like for us now to consider is the essential fact that Jesus was raised to die no more just as we have read in this account. But let's notice over in the book of Acts, the accounts that we have there. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 34, here we are reading and he says, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another Psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. So he's contrasting, of course, David, who was still in the tomb, who did see corruption and decay. But yet Jesus, as we have just read, saw no corruption because he raised himself through the power of God from the dead. And that is what is being given to us here in this account, that he will not die again. No more to return to corruption. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writing to the church in Corinth in a chapter that we are very familiar with, beginning there in verse 20, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So death came to us through Adam. And we understand those events as they were described to us. And life has come to us through Christ, as he is contrasting for us here. Because Christ has risen from the dead, he became the first fruits. And we'll notice further the relationship that we have in regards to this. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. And so we have this essential fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Continuing then in 1 Peter, the first chapter, let's notice there, verse 3. Peter writing to us saying that, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercies hath begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith by salvation, ready to be revealed in that last time. Our faith is based upon the resurrection of Christ. If Christ, as the scriptures tell us, died and did not arise from the dead, our faith is of no substance. The Christian's faith is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have been given these abundant mercies because we are born unto a living hope. And that living hope is 
the resurrection that is before us, the resurrection of life. And that has been revealed to us by Peter and, and many other passages. And then noticing in the Revelation letter, chapter 1 and verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I live evermore forever. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. The great I am. He lives. He died. He was buried. And he arose. And that he lives forever. And so we see in just a few accounts given to us the essential fact that Jesus was raised to die no more. And so this resurrection of Jesus as the first of these three that we're going to consider also establishes and demonstrates for us an assurance. This is an assurance to the world. An assurance that was preached by the apostles throughout the book of Acts. Delivering hope, persuading men. In Acts chapter 3, verse 14, beginning there, and Peter preaching unto them, he says, But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murder to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. So here Peter is convicting them of the sins of the crucifixion of Christ, that they denied the Holy One, they denied the just one. They denied the prince of life. Convicting them of the crucifixion of Christ, but also delivering to them hope. Because God raised him from the dead. Direct your energies, your beliefs, your confidence on Christ. Because he is eternal. And this was established by a great host of witnesses. Also in Acts chapter 4, Luke giving us the account there in verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all of them. They reported and were witnesses, as we know. Physical evidence, eyewitness testimony, the greatest two sources of confirmation and both of those pertain to Christ as we have well studied and Luke giving this account that with great power the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus as revealed to them by the Spirit with powerful words persuading men to place their hope on that which is sure the everlasting life of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 10, Peter here speaking in verse 39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all, excuse me, not to all the people, but to witnesses chose before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So we have this assurance of the resurrection of Jesus and the witness testimony of those that were with him, that witnessed him, that ate with him, that drank with him, that have this testimony. And then in Acts chapter 26, here Paul is giving the account to us before King Agrippa. In verse 22, in Paul's defense and discussion with the king and persuading him, he says, Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and will proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Here he describes God's eternal purpose to bring all things together within Christ Jesus. And as we talk about the prophets, the faithful before God throughout all ages that believed in the resurrection, 
here Paul is bringing this to a summation before King Agrippa that Christ would suffer and that he would be the first to rise from the dead and proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles to all people for all time God's eternal purpose to bring all things together within Christ Jesus and this proclamation has been made to all men and so this resurrection of Jesus serves as another purpose for us in not only demonstrating and bringing forth assurance to the world that there is a resurrection but also a comfort to us who are Christians in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 let's begin there in verse 14 for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so God will bring him those who sleep in Jesus for if we believe that Jesus died excuse me I have a mistake there um, for we say that by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise again then we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord and then noting verse 18 therefore comfort one another with these words as we have been recognizing and studying the persecution that has come upon the church the persecutions that we see with the wave that is rising within our own nation of the things that people are being in no longer tolerant of intolerant concerning the hope that we have of Christ within us and we see here as is written by Paul to the church in Thessalonia that or Thessalonica to the Thessalonians that Jesus died and rose and that God has brought forth this great hope and comfort to us and said by his words to us that there will be again the coming of the Lord to deliver the kingdom because we who are asleep will arise and he is describing these things that those that remain will be caught up in the clouds together with the Lord as we have described the, the deliverance of the kingdom unto the Father because we will overcome all things in this life and this life will be ended and these things should serve as a comfort to us and then also in the fifth chapter of first Thessalonians for God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him therefore comfort one another and edify one another just as you also are doing heaven was created and is determined to be a place for us a resting place for the obedient hell was prepared for satan and his angels a distinction is going to be made and god has appointed us unto salvation it is god's desire that all souls that all people would be saved and this should serve as a great comfort because God's desire is salvation for us he would have us to be heirs and joint heirs as described with Christ throughout all eternity so the resurrection should serve as a comfort to us and a means of edification of strengthening to one another so we see Jesus then as the first of the three great resurrections and now I'd like for us to look at the second of the three great resurrections and that's the resurrection of baptism we are made alive with Christ in Ephesians 1 verse 4 but God who is rich in mercy because he has great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace we have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ 
So he's telling us here that God's great love and mercy has been brought to us. That we were dead, alienated, separated from God because of our sins. He has made us alive together with Christ. And we are saved by the grace of God. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. And the church is a heavenly place. It is a place that God purposed for us to be in. It is a source of God's purpose to bring us all together within the church, within the kingdom of God, and that we are in the presence of God in the church. In Colossians 3, in verse 1, he says, If then you were raised with Christ, such, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. The question then, the condition is, if we have been raised, have we been raised with Christ? If we have, our affections and the things that we seek of this life need to be directed towards the things that are spiritual. Focusing on Christ and the salvation that he has given to us and the revelation of his will and his testimony. And so we have this illustration that is given to us by Jesus as this example of our hope through the resurrection of baptism. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, he says, Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that Jesus as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also will be in the likeness of his resurrection. If we are in the likeness of his death by being buried in the waters of baptism to arise to walk in newness of life, we have confidence. God has stated to us here through his word, Christ teaching us in likeness of his death, we will be in likeness of his resurrection. There is going to be a resurrection. And Jesus indeed was resurrected from the dead. And we too can participate in the resurrection of life right now in compliance to the resurrection that we have through the waters of baptism to be buried in death to arise to walk in newness of life. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, we are buried with him in baptism in which also were raised with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. God raised Christ from the dead. We had the working of the relationship of God through his power raising us from the dead. It is the working of God, it is the power of God that brings us into newness of life. And the believing in the resurrection of baptism, also the believing is an obeying the form of doctrine that has been given to us. These words, this revelation of God's will. In Romans 6 and verse 17, he says, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So we understand here, a form is a mold. It's a pattern. It's a picture. If you have a form and you put plaster in it, it takes the shape of that. It takes that form. And we are following the form of doctrine that leads us to everlasting life. It is a pattern that we adhere to. And it is from the heart. It must take place in the mind of man. From that heart, we form ourselves according to the pattern of doctrine that brings to us the resurrection of life. We must believe. So the third of the three great resurrections is the resurrection of all at the second coming of Christ. Everlasting joy will be granted to some. 
In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And that's the passage we referenced previously. Daniel believed in the resurrection and told us of this great resurrection, the third of, of the resurrections. And so with the coming of Christ, there is going to be a great resurrection, some to everlasting life, some to shame and contempt. In John chapter 5 and verse 28, he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There is going to be a time of judgment, a time of which all things will be revealed to us and we will all come to a level of understanding and comprehension not previously known. God will reveal all things to us. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sign, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no pain, for the former things have all passed away. The things as we know them in this present life will be gone. There will be a third great resurrection. The final resurrection is hope for Christians. And hope is a confident expectation, an anticipation for good. Do we hope for things that are horrendous, that are evil, that are harmful or hurtful? Not unless we have a jaded way of thinking, but we hope for that which is good. And hope without a method of achievement simply remains hope. We can hope about a lot of things, but it takes a method of achievement of which God has revealed to us. We hope and have a great anticipation for the things that are good. And we do that throughout our entire lives, looking for things that we hope and anticipate, that we would enjoy, that would be pleasurable to us, that will be a blessing to us. And we are encouraged by those things. We are encouraged by hope, as we talked about, and what the apostles preached in the book of Acts. They delivered hope to men because they were lawless, they were in iniquity, and they were separated from God. And then they wanted to persuade them to the hope of the belief of the gospel, that form of doctrine that would bring forth salvation to them, a method of achieving this hope. God has not left us ignorant of his will. He has not left us ignorant of his means by which we can have eternal life, as we said. It's God's purpose that all would be saved. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, John writes to us here, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The attributes, the characteristics, the desirable form that we should have. God is holy, therefore we must be holy. If we want eternal life, we're going to follow the form. He is describing to us here that everyone who has this hope in him will do certain things because it requires a method of life, achievement, a behavior, and that is purity. We purify ourselves. As we've studied here, it takes place in the heart of man, in the mind of man. If we want eternal life, we need to be pure in our thoughts, pure in our deeds, pure in our intentions. We are the children of God, and he is going to reveal all these things to us, and we will know things like we've never known them before. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, he says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our, excuse me, 
of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should have this great anticipation, as we've talked about, a confident expectation of eternal life and look for the coming of Christ and not be engaged in this life that our minds are so occupied with the present life and the fulfillment of the pleasures of this life that we're not having our affections directed to the things that are eternal in nature. Because we should look at this as a blessed hope in the glorious appearing of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the final resurrection, the statement made by Job of old in Job chapter 14 and verse 14 will be finally fulfilled. If a man dies, shall he live again? The rhetorical question that Job asked. He knew the answer to that question. And I'm confident that those around him knew the answer to that question that he was stating. All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change come. Our change will come, as spoken by Job of old. There will be a change. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 51 beginning, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We will be changed into that which is an eternal creature of God, to glorify Him, and not the temporal that we are housed in presently. There will be a change. If we die, our bodies will see corruption. If we are caught up in the air with him and we're living, we still will be changed. Because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that is prepared for God's saints. So if we believe in the first resurrection and we are obedient to the second resurrection, then we will rejoice and glorify God in the third resurrection. But if we're not obedient in this life, we also understand that God has made a distinction. There are consequences in this life for the things we choose to do and the things we choose not to do. We don't live a benign life. We're held accountable. There will be, as he states, it is appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. We're not gonna escape those two things. We're not gonna escape death and we're not going to escape the judgment. If we believe in the first resurrection and we obey the second resurrection, then we will rejoice and praise God in the third resurrection. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, he says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. God is faithful. God is able. Studying God's word and being a student of God's word, we know God is able to deliver us. We are confident and assured that what God says is so. God is not a liar. We talked about Satan this morning. Satan is the author of lies, the author of, excuse me, the author of deception. He is the spirit of adversity. He is adverse to all that God is and all that God represents. But God is giving us this confident assurance to know, certainly, if we are united together with Christ in the waters of baptism to arise, to walk in newness of life, certainly we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. But there's a requirement, there is a condition, and that is that we remain faithful and that we serve him and that we have faith that we can see things that are far off because the resurrection is yet before us. It may be closer than we know. We just don't know, do we? We have hindsight. We have a little bit of insight, but we lack foresight. Only God knows the end from the beginning, 
but he is telling us with confidence there will be a resurrection. So if you have not been obedient to the second resurrection and entering into the waters of baptism, to have that confidence and that hope of the third resurrection which will come, we have a song of encouragement that we're going to sing and would desire that you would be obedient unto the gospel call. And if you are not being faithful unto God continuously and have committed public sins that need to be brought before the congregation, we will pray with you and seek that you will be right before God this very hour and continue, as we all do, to, to work to remove the sins from our lives as we have talked about. We want to be pure. And how do we maintain our purity? By repenting and confessing sins and having them blotted out. That we may be clothed in righteousness and be found serving God that we might be heirs and joint heirs in eternal life. So if you are in need of the gospel call, the invitation, the song that we're about to sing, that John's going to lead us, we would ask that you would come forward now as we join together in song. <laughs>